Welcome to Lucretius Today. This is a podcast dedicated to the poet Lucretius who wrote On the Nature of Things, the only complete presentation of Epicurean philosophy left to us from the ancient world. Each week we'll walk you through the Epicurean text and we'll discuss how Epicurean philosophy can apply to you today. If you find the Epicurean worldview attractive, we invite you to join us in the study of Epicurus at epicureanfriends.com where you'll find a discussion thread for each of our podcast episodes and many other topics. We're now in the middle of a series of podcasts intended to provide a general overview of Epicurean philosophy based on the organizational structure employed by Norman DeWitt in his book, Epicurus and His Philosophy. Now let's join the discussion. Welcome to episode 164 of Lucretius Today. For the last two weeks, we've been discussing anticipations in chapter eight of Norman DeWitt's book. And today we come to the last section entitled Feelings. Again, the overall purpose of this chapter is to discuss the Epicurean canon of truth, the idea that there are faculties given us by nature which allow us to test things and determine whether we believe our opinions to be true or not. I think we are all basically on the same page that these canonical faculties don't contain truth themselves. They don't have innate ideas, full-fledged conclusions about things built into them but they serve as a standard, a straight edge, which we can hold up to other things and then measure those things in the context of something that is reliable to us. And these faculties of the canon are reliable in part because they don't contain opinions of their own. You can't get behind them. Things that you see and touch and feel and taste are things that you just simply take that information from your organs of sense And then you process it in your mind and decide what it means. But the organs themselves are not telling you what something means to you. They're giving you some information or points of comparison, but they're not producing an opinion in your mind. That's done in the mind itself. And so for the first two chapters, we covered the five senses and the anticipations. And now we're on the topic of the feelings as a criteria. And of course, when we talk about the feelings, DeWitt quotes Dodds and he's Laertius where he says, The feelings are two, pleasure and pain, the one being akin, the other alien, through which decisions are made to choose or avoid. And so in this section, we're talking about pleasure and pain, primarily in the context of being a part of the canon of truth. We're going to have a whole chapter devoted to the new hedonism later on in the book, where we'll discuss pleasure and pain in much more detail. But for the time being, today, we're discussing the function of the feelings, pleasure and pain as the parallel of the sensations and anticipations, as sources of information that we then take and process in our minds, at which point we then decide how we evaluate it. Cassius, it occurs to me that some people are going to find this maybe a foreign way to think about pleasure and pain. You know, people, when they think about pleasure, they don't think of that sort of natively as being a source of information for the mind. That's not the way people tend to approach these issues. It's a little easier with pain because obviously if you touch a hot stove and that hurts, that's telling you, take your hand off the stove. But it occurs to me that while we do talk a lot about the feelings, about pleasure and pain, it's talking about them in a way that many people, perhaps outside of the forum and outside of our circle, would find unusual to think of this as being like a primary source of knowledge about the world that we live in. So it's good to have that as the focus here in this chapter, because I I really think that that could be a challenging and new way to look at it for some people. I agree we can't hit that hard enough because we often talk about pleasure as the goal or the guide of life. And so we end up talking about pleasure in the context of, well, is the goal of the guide of life really reason and logic or is the goal of life to pursue virtue? Is the goal of life to follow the will of God? And that's one context of pleasure and pain that we more frequently think about. But in this context, we are really still back in that framework of addressing, for example, Plato's cave or the skeptics. We're addressing this contention that nature has not given us the faculties by which to know what's really true or false or not. And that in the case of Plato, we're in a cave and we have to be led out through geometry and other types of esoteric philosophy. Or in the case of a totally religious person who's going to say you just need to commune with the gods or God to be told what to do. 
the context we're still in is this issue of Epicurus looking at nature and saying that there is a way that nature has given us to live successfully on this earth and to decide between things that are false and things that are true. And part of that process is evaluating whether something creates a pleasurable reaction within us or a negative, painful reaction within us. And of course, what's very important to remember is this Epicurus clearly says you're not always going to choose the immediate pleasurable option. You're not always going to avoid the immediate painful option. So you do have to think ultimately about the choices and avoidances that you're going to make. But in the end, the input to that process has to be whether these choices and avoidances are going to end up creating ultimately more pain than pleasure or more pleasure than pain. If you don't have the information as to whether something is painful or not or pleasurable or not, then you really can't even begin the process of deliberation as to which course to take. Nature tells you that pleasure is desirable to you and pain is undesirable to you, but nature does not tell you not to put your hand on that stove. Nature is going to give you the reaction that if you do put your hand on the operating stove, you're going to be burned and it's going to feel bad. But nature doesn't give you all that context of what a stove is and whether it's turned on and whether it's turned off and all of the different evaluative processes that we think about in normal daily life. The part that we're looking at today that nature is giving us is that in a certain context of circumstances, that context of circumstance is extremely painful or pleasurable to you. He uses the word signals here, which I find interesting. It makes me think of some of the things I know about ants in Mm -hmm. the life of ants. Let's talk for a little bit about the life of ants. There was some research that was done with a certain type of ant. They emit a chemical when they die, and then that's how the other ants know that they're dead, right? And what scientists found was that if they took this chemical and painted living ants with it, then the other ants in the colony would pick up these living ants and drag them over to the dead pile and toss them on. And then they'd walk off again. And then the ant would go, no, 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 you go over there. You know, most of how they communicate with their world is through scent trails and stuff like that. So when you have mixed signals or you don't properly understand the signals, you can get into problems like the problem you have with the hot stove. I don't know if that was helpful or not, but I do like that story. (laughs) Yes, I think it was helpful. Of course, the sentence that I'm looking at that DeWitt says that is, quote, this means that pleasure and pain are nature's go and stop signals on all levels of existence, that of the lower animals included. And so what DeWitt is doing in the first part of this section of the chapter is he is getting into some relatively deep philosophy about the distinction between feelings and sensations. And he's giving some arguments about why you should not think that they're exactly the same. This is something we've talked about a lot, whether the feelings, the anticipations, the sensations, almost certainly everybody agrees they work together. But are they really just the same thing? Are they three separate faculties or do they work in a sequence or simultaneously? There's questions like that that cause some issues that DeWitt addresses here in this section that if people are interested in, they they can read about. We can pick up on this issue of something that Don cites a lot, which is nociception. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. This is the sensation of pain, as opposed to the way Epicurus looks at it, which is pain as a feeling. Nociception, of course, refers to specifically bodily pain. You could sort of bring that into the fold by interpreting Epicurus's feeling of pain as all other domains of pain, including mental pain, anguish, anxiety, fear, things like that present to us as a kind of pain. I think what you're talking about there is related to a sentence that he has where he says, quote, lastly, unless the feelings are something distinct from both sensations and anticipations, Epicurus would lack a criterion on the level of the higher emotions where the issue of happiness and unhappiness is ultimately decided. And that could be read probably in different ways, too. But when you talk about the sensation of putting your hand on the stove, that's pretty easy to understand as being a physical reaction. When you talk about the feeling of pleasure or pain that you get from observing justice, for example, or talking about divinity or something else that's more abstract, it's much less obvious that you're talking about a touch type of reaction. But the feelings are nevertheless active in both putting your hand on the stove and in evaluating a work of art or a book of literature or fairness, justice, divinity, those things. 
And so the fact that this is identified as separate from the sensations gives Epicurus a framework in which we're also evaluating in the sense of deciding whether it's pleasurable or painful for us, these things that we don't really touch, we just think about. Yeah. And, you know, putting your hand on the hot stove is the perfect example because this is something that is so reflexive. It really doesn't even involve the brain. I mean, you touch the stove, there are the nerves in your fingers or hand senses the heat. And when it's hot enough, in other words, when they get so triggered, the signal travels to your spinal cord and your spinal cord immediately fires back the signal, which is pull your hand away. So it's feelings at both levels. It's that level that's so reflexive and so physical that it doesn't even involve any thinking faculty at all. It's just nerve signals from the hand to the spinal cord and back again to everything that's above that, all the way up to standing in the Louvre and appreciating the Mona Lisa, that, that kind of thing. So it's a huge subject, I guess, is what we're talking about. We're talking about a small part of it, but it goes, I mean, there are gradations to pain and pleasure all the way down, all the way up. Yeah, and I'm looking at that paragraph now from on page 151, where he's talking about how the feelings are giving you that gradation of pleasurable reaction and that it's the feelings are registering this gradation. And what he says here, this is the first sentence of that paragraph. He says, it would also be obligatory should the feelings be merged with the sensations to ignore all gradations in pleasures, which Epicurus did not. If feelings and sensation are the same and pain consists of putting your hand on a hot stove and touching a needle and these other things, but it doesn't consist of things like mental pains and anxiety and anguish and those kinds of things. If it doesn't consist of that, it consists exclusively of bodily sensations, then you wouldn't have these gradations and you would have a two-legged cannon instead of three. I think you did a great job with that. Critically important because in the end, we are not letting immediate physical sensations control everything we do. We are evaluating their result. We're deciding which pleasures we believe to be more pleasurable than others and which we wish to pursue. We've got a banquet, as the letter to Mercia says, a person going to a banquet does not choose the most food, but the best, which is not to say that it would not be legitimate for a person if he just wants to choose the most food, if he's the type of person who just likes to eat till he's overstuffed and that's his greatest joy, then I'm not sure Epicurus would really criticize that other than remind him that the consequences of that are likely to be not exactly what he expects them to be. But as far as the choice among different pleasures in life, it seems clear that there's a wide variety of things that can be chosen and that nature is not telling you which exact ones to choose, but that your sense of pleasure is helping you evaluate at this level of feelings whether you wish to spend your time at the hot dog stand outside the Louvre or whether you wish to go inside the Louvre and look at the Mona Lisa and other things like that. Yeah, if the feeling of pleasure is exclusively restricted to a sensation, it doesn't even make sense to talk about that as being the good. I right. think that's part of Epicurus's problem here. Is the good just shoveling things in your face all day long because it's exclusively those sensory pleasures that you're interested in? There's nothing wrong with getting pleasure out of food. I, I love food. But for it to answer to the total interest of a whole life and serve as the good, the purpose, it has to, I think, stand for more than that. It has to include things like mental pleasures and, and so on. Which are not just so divorced from the sensations that we're just going to lock ourselves in a library and never come out for the rest of our lives. But they are separate things that have to be considered. If you wish to come up with a logical system of thought and a reasonable way to pursue a life that makes sense, then you have to think about these things and realize that immediate pleasures and pains of the moment are not the only pleasures and pains you're going to experience, because unless you're going to die at that moment, you're going to have pleasures and pains after that. And the consequences of your choices have to be projected out into the future if you're going to consider the whole picture. The big picture perspective just seems to be really key to Epicurus in many aspects of his philosophy. You're just not going to get so narrowly focused on one aspect of things that you lose sight of the big picture. This is the issue with polyanus and astronomy, geometry, all these different specific applied sciences. They're very, very useful and very enjoyable and produce all sorts of good things. But if you get so narrowly focused on astronomy, for example, 
Epicurus makes that specific observation that the person who pursues the science of astronomy may actually end up worse off if he doesn't come to some conclusions about what he's finding. If the discoveries of these awesome new things are not accompanied by an analysis of them that gives the person confidence that they're not created by some supernatural God who's going to throw him into hell for eternity, then he's got a problem. I'm starting to say it's almost as if it is as if once you conclude that the big picture in life is no more than, no less than to live happily, you really are better off being rigorously devoted to those things that actually lead to your happiness as opposed to all sorts of paths that you're not so sure of that could end up in disaster for you. But that's an individual decision that each person has to make because in the end, you're not going to get to the pearly gates and have a book read to you about your choices and avoidances and be judged by the Archangel Michael or anybody else as to the final summation of your life. There really is no final summation of your life after you die or even at any point in it. It's just a matter of living through your individual experiences and getting the most out of it that you can. That would be a good place to find the Thoreau quote. Let me see. Yeah, I don't even know if this is worth bringing in. I'm going to read it, Cassius, <laughs> see if you can make anything of it. Thoreau okay. in his journal writes, you must live in the present, launch yourself on every wave, find your eternity in each moment. Fools stand on their island of opportunities and look toward another land. There is no other land. There is no other life but this. You were talking about having all of your pleasures and pains, fulfillment and all of that reviewed at the pearly gates. That's not how it works. It's a process that you carry with you through your whole life. And it kind of defines in many ways your life. And it's the only one you get, I guess, is where I was going with that. Yeah, you know, Joshua, I definitely think that applies. And it causes me to wonder if, in fact, you know, a lot of analysis of whether you're happy or not seems to me to fit into that same category of being sort of a problem perspective, because you can tell at any particular moment certainly how you sum up things for yourself. But there really is no perspective. And even at the end of your life, you can look back at everything and sort of assess it up and so forth. But there's no special status that's given to you at the end of your life and looking back at it that qualifies you, the 90-year-old Joshua, to pass judgment on the 40-year-old Joshua or whatever. You don't attain a status of superiority by the fact of growing older. You learn things and so forth. But again, does the 90-year-old Joshua really have any grounds for saying that the 40-year-old Joshua is wrong in something when all you can do is live at the moment? There's lots of Epicurus about how the future is not totally out of your hands, but neither is it in your hands. And so you just have to do the best you can. But if you get caught up in thinking that there's going to be a reward, almost like the stoic idea of walking to the top of the mountain. When you're at the top of the mountain, you're as high as you can go. But in the end, you haven't attained any kind of godlike status that qualifies you to look back at your earlier life or your future life and pass judgment on yourself because of some status you've reached. All through the process, you're just doing the best you can, it seems to me. And in fact, I'm looking at 152 as well. The sequence of experience was condensed by Epicurus into the statement, pleasure is the beginning and the end of the happy life. And it seems to me that that's the way you have to look at it, not that by reaching some level of reading or understanding, you've suddenly transcended the normal human existence and become qualified to say, I have lived a happy life. Even at 90 years old, when you're about to die, if you reach that conclusion, you're still just giving your opinion at that particular moment in time, seems to me. Yeah, it's not like you've done it and now you're just sitting around waiting to die, right? That's another thing Epicurus says, is that philosophy is good for when you're young and for when you're old. And when you're old, you're still just pursuing pleasure like you were when you were 20, hopefully, in different ways. And not like you've reached some status at which point you will then glide on in eternity, continuing to enjoy the same status. I get this impression a lot of people do think in those terms that you reach some plateau, almost in Christian terms. Once you've read John 3.16 and you've been saved, it's like you're at some new plateau that you're just going to stay at for the rest of your life and then zoom off into eternity or the once saved, always saved position. I don't think Epicurus is holding out a status that you can reach and then be guaranteed never to fall from again. Life is continuing to work all the way through. Yeah, and you don't want to be locked in. That's my view. 
you don't want to live like a stone, never changing, never growing, anything like that. So let's see. DeWitt talks about the feelings as operating as criteria on all levels of life. And he uses the word somatic, social, and borrowing a religious term, spiritual. And so this is the feelings as criteria. This is the feelings as standards of how we know about what's going on in nature and in ourselves. He says the somatic level, the cub of the wolf, no less than the child, must learn by trial and error to choose the pleasant and avoid the painful. You don't have to put your hand on the stove 14 times before you realize that's not a very smart thing to do. And you learn all of that when you're a child. And the lower orders of animals learn that as well. Some of them learn very quickly. I think the blue wildebeest can outrun a hyena when it's like 14 hours old or something like that. Yeah, he talks about how when you're an infant, this is merely instinctive. There's yet no intelligence to take cognition of the sensations. But as you grow older, and in fact, when you're a young person, you can actually drift at the mercy of chance and you just simply, he says, exalt in your strength. I think, you know, the phrase we use is that when you're young, you think you're invincible. You think, <laughs> invincible. You think you're invincible when you're young. You haven't been acquainted with the bad things that can happen. Your mind doesn't have these observations by which to process the longer range results of your choices of pleasure and pain. But says on the level of maturity, if wisdom is attained, pleasure, that is happiness, becomes a conscious objective and also an incentive. In other words, pleasure or happiness becomes the telos or the end. And thus on this last level, the telos itself becomes a criterion by which the decision is made to choose or to avoid. It's an interesting way to look at it, isn't it? That at every stage in the process, it's like pleasure and pain fulfill multiple roles in your life. One of the roles they fulfill is as part of the canon, as this sort of ruler that you hold up to things to know where they fit. It's sort of things that you pursue or avoid throughout your life, but it also constitutes like the goal or purpose of living. And there he cites principle doctrine number 22, which is a really important one kind of frustrating that it doesn't actually name what the telos is, but it's, quote, we must take into our reckoning the established telos and all manifest evidence to which we refer our judgments. Otherwise, all life will be filled with indecision and unrest, with the implication here that the established telos is pleasure. One thing we previously read on this podcast was the Torquatus material out of Cicero's De Finibus Bonorum et Malorum on the ends of good and evil, the title of which kind of implies that there's a counter telos or an anti telos, which I guess for Epicurus would be pain. Yes. You know, leading us into the discussion of the telos versus the good, to which says, hence Epicurus insists upon taking into account all the manifest evidence, terrestrial as well as celestial. If the latter alone is studied, there'll be an increase of wonderment and an end to peace of mind. That's the reference we made earlier to how if you study astronomy without putting things in perspective, you can actually make yourself worse off. He also insists that the sole reason for studying the heavenly bodies is peace of mind and an abiding faith. Thus, the telos, happiness, becomes the criterion. So again, once you've identified pleasure as the goal of life, it becomes a standard by which you weigh everything else. And that, in a real sense, that principle of doctrine number 22 is very clearly directed towards this. And one of the more clear statements in the whole principle of doctrine is about what it is you're really after. Because once you understand that when he says the established telos, he means pleasure, he's saying specifically you must take into account in all of your reckoning pleasure is the goal and then all the evidence. And you refer your judgments to those. And if you don't, all of your life is going to be filled with indecision and confusion. I want to touch on that sentence you read again. And Epicurus insists upon taking into account all the manifest evidence, terrestrial as well as celestial. One thing that celestial means in this context is studying the gods. He says if the latter alone is studied, in other words, if you devote your life to just thinking about the gods, he says there will be an increase of wonderment. That can mean things. I mean, wonderment is a word that's kind of not one we use very often, but it could mean something like awe. It could mean something like surprise or alarm. You know what I mean? So part of that is this image of you're standing on earth and you're looking out into the majesty of the heavens and seeing numberless stars that are so far away that with our fastest craft, it would take you millions of years to get to them. But part of that is that image in Lucretius of grim religion glowering from the sky and 
mortal man is crushed beneath its feet into the dirt. And I think, Joshua, that's a really pretty clear point to understand. It's easy to picture yourself, especially in this day with all sorts of science fiction, great special effects in all these movies. It's very easy to picture just looking out into the universe at the endless numbers of stars and constellations and so forth and just being so overwhelmed by the awe of the sight that you lose the context of who you are, what you're doing, where you're going to go next. It's like in any other kind of intoxication, if you lose control over your perspective of who you are, what you're doing, you can do some very stupid things and bring your life to an end very quickly, too. And so especially, you know, you got these intoxications of all sorts of alcohol, drugs, all these different things that can lead you down a path of destruction. Just standing, being awestruck like a deer in the headlights, is another analogy, at the sky at night would lead you into the same kind of very dangerous intoxication if you don't use your mind to have studied nature and have a comprehensive philosophy of how you think everything is operating naturally. That's kind of a trope that was already ancient when Epicurus was working. This idea that philosophers and astronomers are so absent-minded, they're looking up at the stars all the time, and they'll fall into any old hole because they're not looking at where they're going. There are references to that all over Greek literature. I bet some of our listeners have seen the movie Agora. Who's the female philosopher who's the star, the one who was killed by the Christians in Alexandria, Joshua? What's her name? I haven't seen that movie, but her name is Hypatia. If you do see that movie, one of the scenes, I'm not sure what kind of citadel this was, but it's where the philosophers were working while the Jewish Christian tribes outside were rioting among themselves and trying to break into the library, of course, the Library of Alexandria. It would have been the daughter library. The main library was already destroyed by this point. So what they're working in is the Serapium. That's great detail to add to it. And, not because, and I don't know whether this aspect of the movie is historical or not. But what it shows and why I brought it up is that it shows that at the very moment while these crowds outside were breaking in and about to destroy the library, these philosophers inside were plotting the motion of the solar system on the floor, it seems like. They've just totally consumed in their work while their whole world was about to fall in around them. They let their work distract them from the reality of what was going on. Now, maybe they had no choice. Maybe there's all sorts of ways to defend that. But it always struck me as an example of how you can let your fascination with some particular narrow subject blind you to things going on around you that will ultimately lead to your destruction. Yeah, it, it was said that Archimedes, who was killed when the Romans invaded Syracuse, which is on the island of Sicily, that he was so enraptured in doing exactly that, working out diagrams of the heavens and all that and geometry, that he hardly even noticed that there was an invasion going on around him. And he was run through with a sword. He was supposed to be kept alive mm. because mm. of his technological advancements and how much they had prevented the Romans in their previous attempts to invade. One of the people who was, I think, allegedly at the Serapium when it was brought low was a pagan poet named Pallidus. And he wrote sort of a poem on the subject, or I guess a, a memorable utterance, let's call it that. And he says, is it not true that we are dead, we Hellenes, likening life to a dream? For while we remain alive, our way of life is dead and gone. And if you want to read more about Alexandria, the book The Rise and Fall of Alexandria by Justin Pollard and Howard Reed is one of my all-time favorite books. So basically where DeWitt is going is that the feelings do serve as a criteria, even though they're not measuring the same thing as what the eyes are or the ears are. They're not appreciating or recognizing patterns as the anticipations are. But what they are doing is evaluating every aspect of life that is significant to you. Again, as DeWitt continuously talks about, whether it's just your day to day life, the things you sense physically or the things that are in your mind, they're giving this evaluation of stop or go in everything that comes to your attention. And what DeWitt goes on to talk about is that this applies with the issue of death. There's certainly a very powerful emotion that comes when we think about death. But again, that's one of those circumstances like we're talking about with the stars is that if you think about where you are in the great scheme of things and realize that when you're dead, you're not suffering any pain, then you can come to terms with the idea of death and be reconciled to it and not be in total fear of it. 
Same thing with the gods. As Joshua talked about earlier, if you understood properly what a nature of a god would entail, that a god does not suffer, nor does he cause pain to other people, then you're not going to be living in fear of the gods. The next example to what it gives is, is to the fear of justice and injustice. And he quotes something from the New Testament stated by Paul, where he, Paul said, quote, the power of sin is the law. And he equates that to Epicurus's perspective on justice, where wrongdoing is not evil in itself, but that the evil to us comes in the pain, basically the fear of punishment. So that once again, the feelings are weighing in. Or again, we've been talking a lot lately about fairness and monkeys and celery and grapes and so forth. And this is where, again, the feelings are weighing in that the monkey that's getting a celery instead of a grape is just not mechanically responding to this. He's feeling the pain and the displeasure at observing that his monkey next to him is getting grapes while he is being given celery instead. So you've got the feeling serving as a criteria on basically every important aspect of life. And presenting Cassius in somewhat unusual ways, he says at the bottom of that paragraph, he says, on the side of Epicurus, it may be said that while arguing within the scheme of his premises, he was also discerning the dependence of happiness upon a clear conscience. The nagging of your conscience you mm -hmm. feel as pain and a clear conscience, particularly a conscience relieved, you feel as pleasure and that in this case, presents as evidence of epistemology. It, it tells you things about yourself and about the world you live in. It tells you things about your relationships with other people. Yes, you're not born, you're not given by God with some kind of a dictionary in your mind where there's a list of actions in life. Or, for example, somebody might say, maybe you're born with a list of 10, perhaps, particular instructions or even 10 commandments that you're born with these things inscribed in your mind. And when you come across a new activity of life, your mind looks them up like on a spreadsheet. It goes three down, four across, sees that the activity is killing someone. And the reaction that's prescribed by this spreadsheet is that it's wrong. That's not the way things work. Epicurus observed. You don't have that kind of a spreadsheet pre-programmed in you you have the feeling of pleasure and pain, which registers to you reactions that stem from just the way you're constituted. The genetic background, the physical aspect of the way your mind and body works produces these results without evaluation, and that that therefore then serves as the criteria. You gather this information, killing is going to generate bad things, at least in most cases. But on the other hand, sometimes you do it anyway. If you're in a war or if you're in a situation where you have to prevent a greater bad thing from happening. So there's no way your brain could be programmed into a single book, for example, that tells you what to do in every circumstance. It's up to you using these criteria to make a judgment for yourself and live with the results. And one application of all of this is choosing a career. He goes on to this part. Mm -hmm. That the career of the orator, for example, allows a man no rest. A career as a politician involves you and in demands on your time and threats to your life. That was more true probably in the ancient world, the threats on your life part. You see that at the end of the Roman Republic, how many of them ended up dead, just about all of them. And dovetailing with that is, is issues related to the desire for riches, power, or fame, all of which mm -hmm. kind of are a double-edged sword in some ways. And do it summarize that part by saying that as Epicurus himself expressed it, quote, what will be the result for me if the object of the desire is attained and what if it is not attained? Meaning that you have a practical analysis of your career choices, your justice choices, your choices about thinking about the gods, all of these things that you do in life that are important aspects central to your life. They have consequences, and you are not just simply following some authority. You're not doing what God tells you to do. You're going to be evaluating the results of your choices according to the feelings that they ultimately produce, which leads us into the final paragraph of this section, which is a controversial issue in many of our discussions about Norman DeWitt. And in this context, hopefully we'll present it in a way that I think Professor DeWitt intended. Let me just skim the highlights of this paragraph and then we'll talk about it. As a criterion, the feelings may take precedence over reason. 
Plato, for example, argued endlessly about the meaning of good. Epicurus scorned this dialectic and arrived at a simple solution. His line of attack is as follows. The greatest good must be associated with the greatest pleasure. This greatest pleasure is easily identified. Quote, what causes the unsurpassable joy is the bare escape from some terrible calamity, unquote. This joy arises from the saving of life, the escape from shipwreck, for instance. Therefore, life itself is the greatest good. To think of pleasure as the greatest good is an error. Pleasure is the telos and is not to be confused with the greatest good. The testimony of the feeling functioning as a criteria is decisive. And then he goes on to say that more will be said about this in his later chapter on hedonism. But the point that DeWitt seems to be focusing on here is that good is an evaluation. Feeling of pleasure and pain is a stop and go signal. But whether something is in fact good is much more complicated than the issue of whether we actually feel pleasure or pain in a particular moment. And in the end, is there some good floating in the air that trumps our feeling of pleasure and pain? Because we don't always immediately follow pleasure and avoid pain. Is there something that exists higher than pleasure which tells us what to do? And many ways to say this, I'm sure Joshua will come up with a better one, but one way would be to say that the good is an evaluation of the mind as to what ultimately you would like to accomplish or achieve. Now, the relationship, the use of feeling as the criteria is that there is no criteria for what is good other than pleasure itself. And so you do consider when you're intellectually thinking about the greatest good of your life, the greatest asset that you have, you can sit back and evaluate all sorts of different aspects of things and come to the conclusion that happiness is good. But in the end, you judge the good by pleasure. You do not judge pleasure by calling it good. Which of the two is the standard, Joshua? And I think we could stay with that for a minute. Which of the two is the standard? Are you able to define pleasure by knowing what the good is, or do you define the good by knowing what pleasure is? Which comes kind of first? a chicken, chicken and egg, egg problem. Though. Exactly. <laughs> there you go. There you go. There you go. Okay. You know, it's because pleasure, for example, it takes so many roles in this philosophy. Not only is it a feeling and therefore part of the canon, it's also the telos and therefore the end or goal of life. But to have a goal of life, you have to first have life. That seems to be where DeWitt is going with this. Yes, he says, quote, therefore, life itself is the greatest good, unquote. So is the question you're asking is, do you judge the good of life against the end of pleasure? Is that, I guess, the question? It is it is rather convoluted, isn't it? Well, that's part of the question. Now, somewhere else in DeWitt's writing, he makes the point that pleasure and pain have no meaning except to the living. So there's another argument that DeWitt is making here is that if you're not alive, pleasure and pain has no relationship to you whatsoever. The gods have no relationship. Nothing has any relationship. If you're not alive, nothing's going on in regard to you whatsoever. So in the sense of your greatest asset in life, the thing that's most important for you to have in order to experience anything else, you've got to have life before you can experience pleasure or pain or good or bad or anything is part of his analysis here. You know, part of this is complicated because we're dealing with source material in two different languages. So in Greek, you've got the word telos, which means end or goal. And in Latin, I think Lucretius favored the term sumum bonum, the highest good. Right. And then of course, I mentioned earlier Cicero, uh, de finibus bonorum et malorum, on the ends of good and evil, or sometimes translated on moral ends. So I think it's been a thorny issue for a long time. But you're right to say that none of this means anything if you're not alive to experience it. Isn't this kind of, it connects with something that Thomas Jefferson, I take it, was fond of saying, which is that the earth belongs in usufruct to the living. He's talking maybe there in more particular contexts about how to use resources and how to pass laws and how long should legislation apply and each generation makes up its own rules and all that. But it's also true, in my view, it's also true that if you allow some ancient book or what your great grandfather said or something to color your perception of reality, he doesn't get to decide what is pleasurable to you. That's the issue, isn't it? That's right. That's right. It's for you to evaluate 
all of this and to emerge with your own conclusions? Neither he nor God nor some book written by Plato about ideal forms, none of them get to decide for you what you wish to do with your life, what you find pleasurable, what you set as your goal. You make the choice of which of these things you're going to follow. There's several things going on here in this discussion, one of which is just this issue of certainly in English, the word goal has a different meaning than the word good. Even if we wanted to attack it in English, Joshua, how would you distinguish good from goal in English? It gets tricky, doesn't it? Because not only is there like the highest good, but we also talk a lot about instrumental goods, goods Mm -hmm. that are good by reference of something which is truly good or goods that are good by reference of assisting you in, in your way to the goal, which is pleasure, right? It's kind of like I was about to make a sports analogy. I'm not going to, I don't know if I should do that. Yeah, go ahead. What I'm thinking of is like, obviously in basketball, you want to get a basket in, right? You want to make a basket. Mm -hmm. The people who don't make the basket, but help you get there are credited with an assist. And so this is where instrumental goods I'm thinking are fitting into the equation. Joshua, in basketball too, you certainly want to score goals, but in the end, the ultimate point of the game is to have more goals than the other side does. So just simply devoting all of your effort to scoring goals would leave the other side free to be scoring their goals as well. And if you're not playing defense at the same time that you're playing offense, then you could score more goals than you've ever scored in your season and still lose the game if the other side has scored more. So even there, scoring goals, I think, would not be 100 percent of the definition of the purpose of having a basketball game. The purpose of having a basketball game is to score more goals than the other side. I regret the metaphor already. No, Uh, no, no. I think it's a good (laughs) metaphor because it shows this distinction between the word goal and the word good, because indeed, pleasure is the goal, according to DeWitt. But in DeWitt's terms, it's life itself, which is the greatest good. Sounds like a rabbit hole, but I really don't think it is. Because I think you can come back, Joshua, to what we were talking about earlier. Do you judge pleasure because it comports with some good that you've set in your mind? Or do you judge the good according to whether it is pleasurable? I think when you focus on deciding which of the two controls the other, it becomes more clear what DeWitt is saying here. And especially since we're talking again in the context of the canon of truth. The canon of truth inscribed in your brain when you were born was not for you to become a doctor and specialize in brain surgery and make millions of dollars and save hundreds of people through your brain surgery. The only thing that was inscribed in your mind at birth was this feeling of pleasure and pain that you're going to develop over the course of your life. And so the application of the way you pursue pleasure is going to vary between individual and individual. But the way you can see the common ground in all of it is that you're pursuing pleasure. Yeah. And not pursuing pleasure so recklessly and so heedlessly that like the astronomer who can't take his eyes off of heaven, you fall into a hole in the earth. What's wrong with falling in a hole on the earth? This is where the issue of whether continuing to live. Yeah. Yeah, Well, it's painful, but also taking care of that, understanding that obviously life also is worth preserving to the extent that we can preserve it. Because why is life worth preserving? Because it's pleasurable. (laughs) Because it allows (laughs) us to pursue. I think that's the right answer. I think that's where DeWitt is going. I think that's where Epicurus is going. If you separate these things out and start talking about good without really being clear about how you're measuring the good, then you end up with crazy ideal forms and fantastic gods that don't exist and all sorts of other dreams. You've already mentioned this, but he ends the chapter with more will be said of this in the chapter on the new (laughs) hedonism. This is the way the book is structured. We've talked about it a lot, Mm -hmm. but as in everything we've talked about so far in this entire series, it seems we've barely scratched the surface. You know, again, what is this chapter we're in right now? I think this is a good way to begin to wrap up the podcast today. As we think about where we are in the development of the philosophy and the presentation of the philosophy, where are we right now? Besides just saying we're at the beginning, what has this chapter been about? Because we're now discussing the question of, What is the good? 
that's what he's done here at the end of the chapter, maybe as a sort of a linking device. And, but we're now not really talking about the same thing we've been talking about for most of the chapter. We're now talking about the issue of what is the greatest good. But what has brought us to this point? What has been the point of this chapter? Maybe that we don't know these complicated ideas, and we have to first establish our tools that we're going to use in order to answer the question, is what I think I would say. In other words, that analogy that DeWitt gave earlier about the tools of precision in building a wall versus the stones of the wall. We haven't yet built the wall at this point in our discussion. We really don't even know exactly what this wall is for or anything about it. But we're starting with the process of what tools do we have at our disposal, which is where the canon of truth comes in. And building on that, where physics comes in, which is the next chapter. Exactly. We don't know what the good is. He'll bring up these things and mention them, but then go into detail about them much later. I think he's mentioned it here because it's so frequently talked about. Epicurus says that the greatest good is pleasure and so forth. He's mentioned it here because it's relevant to this question of the tools of precision. But he's not going to answer the question until later on after he's dealt with the nature of the universe in the new physics. Okay, that's the next chapter is the nature of the universe on the new physics. Then he's got an entire chapter, 10, entitled The New Freedom, which took me a second to think about what he's talking about there. I presume this is largely the issue of determinism. His subheadings are freedom and necessity, which is the determinism issue, then freedom from the gods and necessity and fortune, which is fate. So he's going into maybe choices and avoidances, and do we even really have the ability to choose uh, again? That's important Mm -hmm. to know, right, before you know what you can choose Mm -hmm. as as Mm -hmm. the end. Yeah, I think that's the sequence that he's following here. He's first talking about the tools of precision, the, the, the tools of measurement that we have available to us in this chapter eight. Then he's going to go on and into the physics, but definitely talk about the nature of atomism and how it allows us to believe the universe is understandable to at least some degree. And then he's going to go into this issue of choices and avoidances. And do we even really have the ability to be doing what we're doing? Do we have the ability to talk about these things and choose our own conclusions? Or are we just billiard balls bouncing around mechanically? And then after that, he comes to soul, sensation, and mind. That would take us into the question, I think, of is there a spirit? Is that separate from the body? Is it part of the body? That kind of thing. And then he gets to pleasure. I have some questions and thoughts because I think DeWitt is really, really thorough for somebody who is very, very serious about understanding all aspects of Epicurean philosophy. But I do think also that there's some drawbacks with that, and it ends up feeling kind of theoretical and like, how how does this really plug into real life? And today, I think there's some real pearls mixed in with this podcast today that are really important. At the same time, it occurred to me, what keeps something from being too theoretical? Or how do we make something useful and practical? And it seems like if we define things according to problems that need to be solved, then that brings us back to something more useful, something more practical. So for every aspect within Epicurean philosophy, if we asked, what problem does this solve? Or Mm -hmm. what was there that this helps solve? For example, the very chapter that we're finishing up now, you could create a question of what problem is addressed in these ideas. Then from there, go to something very practical. I think that's a great way of looking at it and why we have a podcast team here to help keep us focused on the big picture like that. So that would be a great way for us to end the podcast today is to discuss what is the significance of this chapter eight that we've just finished. As you've said, Calasini, what problems does it answer? Before we move on, what problems have we addressed and answered by discussing the sensations, anticipations, and feelings? What purpose has the canon of truth of Epicurus served? I'm going to steer clear of the sports analogy this time and make a video game analogy instead. Okay. The first Legend of Zelda game, which is still a very popular franchise, was on the Nintendo Entertainment System, which is, I think, the first Nintendo that was available in North America. And one of the first things you find in that game is you walk into a cave and there's, I'm looking at the screenshot of it right now, there's an old man 
and there's like a torch on either side of him. So two torches. And the only thing he says to you is, it's dangerous to go alone. Take this. And he gives you a sword. That's kind of this chapter, isn't it? This is DeWitt giving you the tools you're going to need before you go out into the wide, wide world of physics. And your tools are your canon. It's it's your senses. That's one of your tools. Your feelings, which is what we've been talking about today, is very important. And the anticipations. How are we going to know anything about physics when we get there if we don't know how to know what we know, which is the subject of this chapter? Yeah, Calasini, it's very helpful that you've raised this question at the end of the chapter here to give us the chance to review what we've been doing. Because we're doing a podcast that we understand that this section of our podcast, going through the DeWitt book, is relatively more detailed than many other presentations we might be making. We're going to make other presentations and other ways of presenting the philosophy to different audiences that don't have the time to listen to all the detail that we're going through right now. So what we're doing here is a fairly advanced level of discussion of these ideas by going through the book in so much detail. But again, as Epicurus says, you don't always need to know the details. What you always need to know is the higher level outline that puts everything in perspective for you, just like the torch or the sword that Joss was referring to as these characters. You've got to have the ability, as Lucretius talks about, to have the torch at each step enlightens the path to the next one. You're the hunting dog who is able to sniff out the truth that is hidden underneath the leaves and so forth. You've got to have an understanding of whether you have an ability to arrive at any conclusions and then how to go about pursuing those conclusions. I don't think we could say it enough, and we'll say it here at the end. The question of how to pursue pleasure successfully is a really important topic, because if you don't pursue pleasure properly, you're going to end up with more pain. You're going to be very upset about the whole path in the first place. But the question of how to pursue pleasure is not the first question that people have to answer in their lives. The first question, as soon as they grow up and become taught by their parents and their teachers and their schools and their churches and watching television and so forth, they are bombarded by this idea that it is not proper for you to set pleasure as the goal of your life. So the very first, most basic question that has to be addressed in all of these discussions is, why do we believe that pleasure is the proper goal? Because these other people don't believe that to be the truth. They try to convince us that it is not, that we should pursue these other things. So before it makes sense to discuss how to pursue pleasure, you have to first address this issue of should you pursue pleasure? And Epicurus starts at that basic level of we're going to deal with that question first. We'll talk about how much you should eat and how much you should drink and how much you should engage in sex and how much you should do all these things. I'll have advice for you on that later on down the road. But at the beginning of the road, these other people are standing there at this fork, and they're all pointing in different directions. There's a Lucian's article, Hermotimus, is about this. Everybody is pointing in a different direction about which way to go. You have to decide which road to take because you can't take all of them. You're pointed towards religion. You're pointed towards ideal forms. You're pointed towards rationality and logic. And all of these guys pointing in those directions insist that that is the right way to go. Before you start down the road, because you've only got one life to live, you better use it properly. Before you pick the road you're going to walk down, you have to come to some preliminary conclusions about which road to follow. And this is what we've been discussing. What tools has nature given us to decide which road to follow and how to follow that road? If you don't have that understanding, you're not even going to start down the road. That's probably one of the functions of anticipations in the first place, and certainly pleasure and pain. These are the stop and go signals that tell you to do anything. And so you've got to understand those first. Then you have these issues of the physics and what is the real true reality of the universe and how do roads work and can you get in a car and use wheels and all sorts of things about the way the world works that are important. And then you have to deal with this question of, do you, in fact, have free will? Are you making any decisions at all? Are you just a billiard ball that's being bounced down one of these roads? Do you have the ability to affect your future by picking one of these roads? These are basic questions that not everybody 
immediately today has to deal with because they have a context in their lives where they have come to some type of an understanding about these questions. But really, the idea of looking to Epicurus to tell you how much food to eat and how much sex to pursue, that's not nearly as important as the question of looking to Epicurus in the first place to tell you whether pleasure is the appropriate thing to pursue or not. And so short-circuiting the process is dangerous because everybody gets sick if they eat too much ice cream. And it's not particularly controversial whether you're a Muslim or a Christian or a Platonist or a Stoic or anything else. It's not particularly controversial that you really should know better than to eat too much ice cream. Those kind of questions are helpful and are, are useful. But the more important question is, what is your goal in the first place? And unless you answer these basic questions about the tools that nature has given you to answer that question, you really are at the mercy of other people. You're actually just following paths that have been put in front of you by other people who may not have your best interest at heart. And even if they do have your best interest at heart, they may be wrong. And only you can decide who is right and wrong in that sense and how to spend your life. The only thing that's certain is death and taxes. You're going to reach the end of your life at some point. You're going to look back on it and have to evaluate, well, did I use my time wisely? And that's what Epicurus, it seems to me, was trying to do by questioning everything, questioning the nature of the universe, questioning religion, questioning philosophy, questioning everything, and then taking it apart and then reassembling it in a way that makes sense that produces the most successful result. I think that's largely what we're doing here in following the sequence. And this is not just DeWitt sequences, I think, either. It's clear from Diogenes Laertius that the first letter of Epicurus was to Herodotus, which is all this physics and not only physics, but what we've been discussing, the canon of truth aspects of things. And the second letter of Epicurus was not about pleasure and pain. It was about astronomy and basically the issue of whether there are supernatural gods running the universe. So Epicurus himself, and certainly Lucretius, they consistently followed the pattern between them of addressing these issues of physics, life and death, epistemology, and so forth, along with the idea of pursuing pleasure as the goal. When Lucretius describes at the beginning of Book One the significance of Epicurus and how he was the first man to stand up against the glowering gods from heaven, and he traveled through the universe with his mind and came back to us and explained these truths of the universe— that allow us to live a happy life. All of that is a discussion of significance of the things that he did in studying nature, which he then used to produce his suggestions on pursuing pleasure and avoiding pain. Martin, do you have any closing comments today? Uh, No closing comments. Calasini. Here's the question. As far as the canon, does it answer this question? How do I know if my ideas about the world are correct? Does the canon answer that question? I would say that that question might be too broad for the canon alone to give you an answer. Certainly the canon can help. For example, if I have this idea that a tree is a round purple thing with a (laughs) whatever, you go out inside and look at a tree using your senses, you're going to correct your idea. But many ideas are more complex and involve more processes of the mind than merely just going to look at something or checking it against how you feel or whether it gives you pleasure or pain. And for that, you will occasionally have to bring in secondary faculties or secondary processes, like, for example, logic, reason. The beginning of this chapter was all about demoting reason out of the canon. That doesn't mean that it has no place. It just means that it doesn't have a primary place. Reason is, of course, by definition of the word, a rational process. And all of the elements of the canon are pre-rational. But reason is very important sometimes, I might say actually many times, in sifting through different ideas and trying to find out which one is right. So logic, reason, you could use method, right? Like the scientific method, for example, is a way of finding out whether your idea is correct by testing it. All of these things are involve canonic elements, but in the main, they are outside of the canon, and yet they are still very important. I think this is a very good question, Colosini, to be asking after this chapter on the canon, is what are the limitations of the canon when we're talking about issues like this one?
And I think that while the canon does have pride of place, there are a whole host of other faculties, abilities, methods in our toolkit, and we should be really using all of them. But a very good question. Kalasini, before I respond to that, could you state the question again, or do you have a comment on what Joshua said? Thank you, Joshua, for answering for your answer. So at first I had thought, should the question be, how do I know if my perceptions about the world are correct? But then I changed it to, how do I know if my ideas about the world are correct? And I think they almost have two slightly different senses in depending on the choice of words. I think the answer in general is yes, the canon is going to be your ultimate guide to deciding whether an opinion is true or false. I think Joshua is correct in pointing out that there are other considerations. Again, I really think one of the best essays on this I've read is Lucian's Hermotimus, in which he discusses this question of how do you know at the very beginning, when you arrive at a fork in the road, how do you know which road you're going to take? Because you haven't been yourself to the end of the road to know what's there, and you can't choose every road. How do you decide which road to choose? What authority or what criteria are you going to look to to make the best decision? Because you're not guaranteed that you're going to be right in life. People make mistakes all the time. And so the proper test is just not what is absolute right and absolute wrong, but what's the best you can do with the information that you have available to you? One of the things that Lucian points out in Herbert Timus is that when you start following logic, you can construct ideas, as Martin points out when we discuss logic. Logic can be internally consistent within itself. You can say, let A be this, let B be this, and then something will result from it that is a result of your premises that you've adopted is true at the very beginning. So once you adopt a certain set of principles, you can construct a very complicated structure on top of it, which is internally consistent. The question is, when you have produced this structure, is whether it really has any relevance to the real world or not. And if your question and your criteria ultimately comes down to, is this thing real? Is it true in the sense of being real? then the only ultimate reality in the world is what you come into contact with through your senses, anticipations, feelings. And in that sense, the canon of truth is this ultimate standard. There's no way to get behind it. There's no way to second guess what the senses are telling you because you don't have any direct connection to some other world or some God or some ideal form that tells you that there's a reality beyond your senses. So it's certainly a complicated issue but when you start talking about does the canon assist you in determining what is true, absolutely, yes, it is the starting point of every analysis because there is no basis for analysis outside of this data that nature has provided to you. These criteria of truth are your connections to all the ultimate reality that really has any bearing on you. And so we're not really at the point of being able to pull into a conclusion all these details of the philosophy that we're going to be discussing in much greater detail as we go forward. But absolutely, the reason we are discussing this topic is because unless you have a theory as to what your tools are, you're blowing in the wind. You'll never reach a conclusion about anything. You'll never be confident of anything because you haven't started with the foundation that you have confidence in. We may not be there yet in terms of having complete confidence in this construction. We have so many questions about what anticipations really are, but definitely at the very beginning of your journey, you have to decide what your tools are that you're taking with you on the journey. We'll close this episode today by repeating how important that question is. Everything we have to do has to have a practical result. We're about to go into a discussion of determinism. We're about to go into a discussion of physics. And every step along the way, it's going to be easy to become discouraged by all the details of the questions and to think that this is not practical and not important for us to decide today. Because frankly, you've got to decide how you're going to live your life today, and you're not going to have all of the details you'd like to have about physics or determinism or anything else. You've got to decide what tools you have available to you and use them today, which is March the 5th, 2023, as we're recording this. And yes, amid all the confusion that's out there, all the different possible paths you can take, 
you have to start with what your senses tell you, what your feelings of pleasure and pain tell you, and what your sense of anticipations tell you. That's all you've really got to go with to make your decisions about how to live today and tomorrow and the next day. And so with that, let's close the episode for today. We'll come back next week. And all along the way, we'll bring in any questions that Calasini or anyone else has. If you'll come by the forum and drop them into the podcast threads, we'll address them as best we can as we go forward. Thanks for your time today. We'll come back in a week. Bye.